Hello, I've got a great question today, which is how to come to peace with a loved one's death. The first step to coming to peace with death is to come to peace with life. When we live life authentically, truly authentically, fully, without holding on to anything, we become masters of death in a way. Because to truly flow with life, something new must enter in and something old must leave, the consciousness, the mind. Old belief systems must die. And this is a constant practice for the physical death. If we are bound up in our identifications and what we believe to be true, unwilling to accept new information, unwilling to accept reality as it is without the overlays of beliefs that cloud our perception, we're unable to engage fully in life. As the inner space softens and the sense of self softens and there is a realization that all of the inner narratives and the beliefs, even the emotions that arise within are not ultimately true and are not to be believed. A certain opening occurs uh, that allows an embracing of life, that allows for an authenticity while simultaneously letting go of that which is no longer useful, that which is out of tune with life, that which was just an idea, a projection. And as we s begin to experience life more directly, absent the judgments and projections of the mind, our belief systems. Quite naturally, our capacity to let go increases. And then doing this, of course, we also gain the capacity to recognize that this body will die, just as all bodies will die. That, 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 that just as it is not wrong that a, a, a that an idea or a belief system must die in order to allow something new to enter into the world, so must this body die. It doesn't mean that we are eager for death. It's just an allowance of, or an acceptance of it, as it comes in its rightful time. Let's imagine that someone close to us, a family member, this happened in my family uh, several years ago, in fact, uh, died, uh, a young, a child. We lost an a eight-year-old boy in our family a couple of years ago. Notice the narrative that is likely to come into the mind, which is, that's too early. He died too young. All of that potential was lost. A child should never die before their parents, or a parent should never see their child die. These sorts of narratives occur in the mind. But all of those narratives are based on the idea that that death was somehow wrong for that individual, that that life was somehow unfulfilled. It is possible to live a completely fulfilled life in a matter of a few years. Longer is not better. If one is able to love completely and embrace life completely, it is sufficient. Longer is not better. And so we allow those projections to 
to soften, to fade, real, realizing that they are false judgments. They are not helpful. And then we can truly appreciate the life of the individual. Another aspect that tends to limit our capacity to accept the death of a loved one is our own codependence upon the relationship. You might notice, I've noticed this many times, that some people will be more will feel more suffering as a result of the death of a pet than they do of a family member. And that's because their emotional relationship with that pet was so bound up. They don't have a healthy relationship with the humans. Their relationship with the pet became a very emotional, a kind of emotional crutch. So when the pet dies, they, they suffer a lot because they have nowhere else, no one else with whom they can express that unconditioned affection. Notice, note, I did not say unconditioned love, unconditioned affection. There's a big difference between affection and love. Affection is a reward that, it, that, that does not, or that is able to support negative or positive, healthy or unhealthy behavior. If you give affection to a human being, a child, when they're misbehaving, they will misbehave even more. So many of our relationships, there's some kind of dependency in that relationship, exclusive to that relationship. And so when the individual dies, we don't know what to do. We have no place to replace, we have no one else with which we can replace that emotional conduit. What it really means is that our relationships as a whole have not been healthy that we have not been expressing ourselves truly authentically, nor have we allowed others to express truly authentically. It's a codependent relationship. It's a clinging. I remember at some point in my life, uh, when I was a young man, I was, of course, very interested to, to date somebody, to get to, uh, uh, this would be, I guess, my teens prior to a suicidal state. I was very interested in dating girls and and uh, hoping that someone would be interested in me. And then after I went through that and I had a kind of awakening, uh, I got through that suicidal state, I had a kind of awakening. And then it, a further awakening at about age 22. And suddenly the opposite started to happen and women started to become interested in me. I wasn't so interested anymore. Some of them started to become rather clingy. They really wanted to hold on, and so I just uh, would not allow them to uh, to get their nails in, so to speak. Uh, that's an unhealthy relationship. It, were I to have responded to that, that would turn into a very toxic relationship, a very unhealthy relationship. So love is not desperate, and true love allows the best good for the other person. It supports the best good of the other person. Even if that best good e means the other person should leave, it's better for them to move on. It's not up to us to force them to move on, but it accepts that. And sometimes we may have to actually, we may have to actually force it. Clingy love is about what feels good for us. That's very conditioned, and it's not really love at all. And so once we start to really trust in that, in a larger love, we become, in a way, quite larger and capable of moving forward in life without clinging. It creates a kind of strength that is not, there's no falseness to it. It's not pride. It is doing that which supports the health of all persons, the earth, everything. That includes this person, 
There's no exclusion to it. And as we trust ever more in the awakening process, ever more in this kind of love, ever more in our capacity to handle life, whatever it may bring, even unto death, the clinginess drops away ever more. The sense of self drops away ever more. And there is a, a broadness that accepts even death, that can be even happy in death. It doesn't mean there won't be some layers of sadness. If there is, express that authentically too. There should be no artifice, no lie. If there is sadness that arises, so be it. Be honest and admit there is sadness. In this kind of broadness, uh, I remember our dog passed away a couple years ago. And we had her, her name was Satori, means enlightenment. We had her for 13 years, if I recall. She was a, a sort of a, an offshoot of a German shepherd. Beautiful, long hair, very strong personality. She was definitely an alpha type dog. Really, really good dog, though. And I remember when we, when we, um, she, she had had an infection in her left hip. It was rotting out her muscle and everything. There was really nothing that could be done that would be helpful in this situation. And so it was time to put her down. She was in a lot of pain. And my wife and I were there when we put her down. When they injected her with the, I think it's high concentration of potassium. I don't remember what it is that they put in that stops the heart. It's instant. I remember being there with her when they injected her and feeling how right it felt. It was rather surprising how right it felt. And how I also felt she agreed. She knew what was going on. That's what I felt. Maybe that's a projection. Or maybe that's a reality. But I remember the, that, uh, the feeling of rightness was so strong. And so there wasn't sadness. But when we took her home and we dug a grave for her and we buried her, when I put the last shovel full of dirt over her, we covered up the body and the last thing showing was her beautiful fluffy face. Put the last shovel full over the face, then I cried. And it was the recognition that that was the last time I would see that beautiful face. There was no wrongness in that. There was appreciation for her moving on for life moving on in the flow of life, something new would enter in. We ended up getting another dog a few years later. He's a beautiful young boy, lots of uh, joy in his life, and he shares that joy with us. That's the nature of life. One thing moves on and something new comes in. It's like swimming through water. We must embrace the movement or we sink we must let the water pass by as we move forward. Death is like that. And the more, the, the broader one becomes, the more authentic one becomes, or more authenticity, authenticity shines through the body, and the more that the body is able to move through life accepting it as it is and making adjustments as it goes through the flow, because the body is also part of life, the more we're able to be of help to others who are going through the mourning, who are going through the death of a family member. And that's very, very important because many people will fall apart when they have undigested relationship issues, when they have undigested um, issues with death and life when they have regrets and they fall apart and they're dysfunctional. They may be highly aggressive at that time. So it's very, very helpful to have somebody there who's aware, who's able to hold the space of clarity, who's able to get something functional done, 
maybe even arranged a funeral and that sort of thing. So it's, it's very, very helpful to just practice this in daily life, allowing beliefs to die off and accepting life as it is, as it comes. I hope that helps. If you have any questions, uh, if you'd like any clarification on this, uh, you can write a question in the comment section or you can email me. I have a link below. Uh, those who, who find these videos helpful, if you'd like to make a donation, there's a link below where you can do that and it'd be much appreciated. Thank you so much. Uh, some some individuals uh, would be interested in, in a, a conversation via YouTube. I call this public mentoring. Or if you'd like private mentoring, that's also an option. You can go to my website, link below, and you can see the mentoring page. Thank you. Bye-bye.